celebrating the 25th anniversary of the birth of the Accessibility of Ontarians with Disabilities Act. So happy birthday to us. Today is also a celebration of the United Nations International Day of Persons with Disabilities 2019. We are very fortunate to have these two important milestones to celebrate today. So as I was saying earlier, my name is Wendy Porch, and I'm the Executive Director at the Centre for Independent Living in Toronto. We're also known as SILT. Uh, SILT is by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. We believe in the importance of independent living and the rights of people with disabilities to live in the community, to make choices, examine options, and to lead full lives. Our celebration today has been organized by a number of partner organizations, including the ALS Society of Canada, the AODA Alliance, the Arthritis Society, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, Easter Seals Canada, March of Dimes Canada, MD Canada, the MS Society of Canada, the Ontario Brain Injury Association, and Spinal Cord Injury Ontario. So it is a huge list of partners, and thank you very much to all of our partners for taking part in the celebration today. Thank you. And we are very fortunate to be joined by a number of MPPs today, including Minister Raymond Cho, who's sitting just to my left, the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility, who will be speaking a little bit later today. So today marks the 25th anniversary of the birth of the AODA. Canada's first disability-specific legislation intended to build an Ontario where people with disabilities are truly able to be part of the community. Here, around 25 years ago, a small group of determined people with disabilities came together in Queen's Park to develop the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Coalition to push for legislation that would eventually become the AODA. The passage of the AODA was a nonpartisan effort fueled by us, a grassroots movement of people with disabilities showing leadership and building a world that we want, one that is accessible and includes us. It is fitting therefore that the UN theme for today is promoting the participation of persons with disabilities and their leadership, taking action on the 2030 development agenda. The UN Sustainable Development Agenda calls upon the world's countries to leave no one behind, recognizing that disability cuts across all genders, all races, all classes, and impacts us all. The grassroots leaders of the AODA movement knew this 25 years ago and worked together to envision an accessible future. As CEO of a disability service organization, and as a person with a disability myself, I believe it is critical for us service providers to make it a top priority to uncompromisingly ensure that the voices of people with disabilities in the grassroots movement are heard and heeded in the halls of government and in the community. And so here we are today celebrating exactly that, the grassroots movement towards an AODA. This year, people with disabilities and government also work together for the passage of an Accessible Canada Act, Bill C-81, Canada's first legislation towards an inclusive and accessible nation. So when people with disabilities lead the charge, and when we work together, we truly can change the world. But we still have work to do. So just as a, as a personal story, I was born with my disability. And growing up as a kid with a disability, I never saw myself or my experiences reflected in the world around me. Can you still, can everybody still hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. So no matter what I was doing as a kid with a disability, I felt pretty conspicuous. Uh, I was very often asked, what's wrong with your hands? And I would sometimes say I was born like this. I would frankly sometimes say it was a shark uh, incident <laughs> while I was scuba diving with Jacques Cousteau in Lake Ontario. <laughs> so it really depended on who asked. Uh, that was, it got me big respect from all the seven-year-olds that I knew. <laughs> Uh, but either way, the, the reason why I'm raising this is because I did not have a sense of community growing up. I didn't see anybody else like me. And this is important because what the UN uh, Day, the International Day, means to me, it means visibility. It means that this morning I got to hear my six-year-old son shout to his best buddy, Axel, across the schoolyard, 
hey Axel, it's International Disabilities Day. And that, that really happened, that's pretty amazing. It means that the world has acknowledged that the global one billion of us folks with disabilities exist. We are here, we are visible, and we deserve nothing less than full inclusion. And our numbers are only growing. Aging is the number one cause of disability. And as David Lepofsky, he's gonna love this, the wonderful great, great, great grandfather of the ADA. <laughs> So accessibility is good for everyone, and this is why we must celebrate 25 years of the AODA. But we still have a long way to go, and the great grandfathers and grandmothers of this movement are seeing new, younger voices added to this chorus. We are harnessing the power of new leaders to carry forward these messages about the importance of visibility, accessibility, and inclusion. Today we will hear from government on the importance of working together to achieve the vision of the AODA, the sparks of which were ignited here 25 years ago. And today we will also hear from some young leaders in the grassroots disability movement who will tell us about their hopes for the future and how they will work towards a vision of inclusion. Listen closely everyone, because while we are celebrating today, we all have work to do. And it is important that we make space for emerging and diverse voices and that we do this work together. So following the speeches today, there will be cake, because what is a birthday party without cake, frankly? Oh, yeah. uh, so please stay to celebrate what we have achieved and what comes next. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker on the panel today, Minister Raymond Shore, the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. last year and two days later I got hit by a stroke. Wow. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, then that's, uh, that's why. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I, before I say a few words on this birthday party, uh, I'm so glad the MPP Daisy Way, she's right there, my parliamentary assistant is here, and the MPP Andrea Kanjin over there, and the MPP Nina Tangri, where is it, Nina Tangri? And I saw MPP Sheriff Saboway. I also saw Assistant Deputy Minister. Stand up, Susan. Tangri is there. And my policy advisor. Uh, accessibility Policy Advisor Mike Thomas is here. My Chief of Staff, uh, Russia Legion, and another uh, Policy Advisor, Jay Jung, and the Tarun is uh, here from my ministry. See, I brought so many people here. <laughs> I know uh, so many people will speak. By the way, everybody knows uh, my cri critique, uh, MPP uh, Joe Harden, he always give me hard time in the house. Thank you, Wendy, for a nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you all as we make mark the United Nations International Day of persons with uh, disabilities. I'd like to thank the many organizations that have come together to host this fantastic reception. Oh, I, I forgot, uh, I volunteered to be a golf coach for Dave Rothowski. I make a public announcement. <laughs> no, I have to keep my promise. These groups, all of you, are working hard to improve the lives of people with disabilities in Ontario. 
everyone here understand the importance of a creating, creating an Ontario that is more inclusive and accessible for all citizens. Our government is committed to protecting what matters most to people with disabilities and their families by helping to remove accessibility barriers. We are empowering everyone to drive their own future on their own terms. To make this happen, everyone here today needs to come to work together in the disability in, in the disability communities, business, not for profit, and broader public sectors. My ministry continues to gain valuable input from people with disabilities who have lived experience as we advance accessibility in Ontario. These insights are key as we take action to make our province a place where everyone can be independent, work, and contribute to the economy. As you know, accessibility is a journey, and everyone here is on this journey together. Our government continues to work to improve understanding and awareness of accessibility. And we are committed to breaking down barriers through the accessibility for Ontarians with the Disabilities Act. Beyond the law, we aim to create social changes that requires both attitudes and behaviors to change. Ontario is advancing accessibility, but a lot of work still needs to be done. This work cannot be completed overnight, and it cannot be accomplished alone. We are so thankful to be working with many valuable partners all over here, some of which are here today and uh, as we move ahead on our accessibility journey. We are pleased to be here in celebration of 25 years with me since the grassroots movement that supported the development and implementation of accessibility legislation in Ontario began. As all of us continue our efforts to advance accessibility, I am proud of the future our government is building to make our province open for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Cho. I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Danielle Kane. Danielle, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Hi there. For those who don't know me, my name is Danielle King, and uh, last summer I was one of the victims of uh, the Jan shooting. And I just wanted to share my story and my experience uh, with you today. So, growing up, I was always proud to be Canadian, proud to know that in a country like ours, people are taken care of when they become sick or injured. And this, of course, is thanks to our strong public health care system. So when I was shot in the chest on a warm summer night, July last year, there was a whole team of people ready to repair my spine. A team ready to repair my internal injuries. A team to nurse me back to health. And a team to rehabilitate me to my new life with paraplegia. Despite all the assistance I received, 
They did not prepare me for the world outside the rehab center, where there's a never-ending set of challenges for someone like me. First and foremost, I could no longer live in our basement apartment. The entrance was inaccessible. In fact, at the time my partner and I were looking, there wasn't a single wheelchair accessible unit available for rent in the, in the entire GTA. Instead, we settled on an accessible-ish unit priced at more than double the rent we had been paying previously. Unfortunately, after a few weeks of living there, I realized I would never be able to make the large, uneven transfer I needed to be able to shower there independently. Luckily for me, my story was well known, and I received a lot of media attention. The GoFundMe set up in my name received over $200,000 in donations. With this money, my partner and I were able to secure our own home in Oshawa, which, as we speak, is currently under renovation to make it fully accessible. But not all folks living with a disability are so fortunate to be a headline. Many are living in inaccessible spaces where they just make do or get by. This is simply not acceptable. People with disabilities should at the very least feel comfortable and safe in their own homes. Throughout this ordeal, I encountered discrimination several times on Airbnb. Hosts rejected me upon learning that I am a wheelchair user, even after I assured them that their inaccessible space was actually accessible enough for me, considering the abundance of inappropriate accommodations. In one case, I was rejected by someone who thought the four steps at their entrance would be too much of a risk for me, which actually led us to have to stay in a townhouse unit with an 18-step entrance in order to save money. So in case you were wondering, my strong, helpful partner would lift me up the stairs to get me inside. So finding accessible, affordable housing is just one of the big, intractable issues faced by people with disabilities today. On top of that, some of us have nowhere to pee. All the washrooms with a wheelchair accessible sign are not fully accessible to all those who need it. Some of us need an adjustable padded bench with the help of a Hoyer lift in order to do our business. And the typical accessible washrooms are simply not equipped. The lack of suitable facilities means I've had to organize my life around where and when I might be able to find a place to go. And this almost always means I cannot take a long trip or visit certain places without significant planning on my part. Throw on top of this longer wait times for wheeltrans, a lack of or abuse of wheelchair accessible parking, countless curbs with no cuts, entrances with just a few steps, buildings with no elevators, elevators that don't work, elevators that are overrun, and you are only scratching the surface of what people with a disability have to live with on a daily basis. This is why we must continue to push to make our province more accessible for all of our states, because everyone is just one accident or one misstep away from a life like mine. Thank you, Danielle. And Danielle, you're one of these young grassroots folks I'm talking about, we need to listen to your voice. And your observations on what we still need to be doing are very important. So thank you very much for being here. And I'd like to talk to you later, Danielle. And there you go, connections already. Uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce our next speaker. 
uh, Mr. Joel Harden, the NDP Helmsman.
For someone in a wheelchair, stairs in front of a building are an insurmountable barrier. For me, a meeting room with blaring loud sound or music is an insurmountable barrier. We all deserve a barrier-free society. My generation was born after rights for people with disabilities were included in the Charter of Rights and the Human Rights Code. We were young children when the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act was passed. These are not rights that we had to fight to create. These are rights that we believe to be our rights that we were born with. And yet, these are not rights that we see honored in our society today. We are ready to take up the torch of the fight for accessibility and inclusion. We are the newest voters, or about to become the newest voters. Y'all be the damn right. I am so sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch out in 2022. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we're ready for action, so let's celebrate today, and then let's get to work. Thanks so much, Claire, and more wise words from our young grassroots leaders today. Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Abdit Mene the Deputy Leader of the Ontario Green Party. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for having me here today. It's an honor to represent the Greens. Uh, today on the International Day for People with Disabilities. Um, uh, unfortunately, Mike couldn't make it here today because uh, he had some work, but that's the problem when you're a cause of one. So I do hope that you elect far more Green MPPs in 2022 so we can share the work. Uh, oh, I believe that as well. Yeah. <laughs> so first thing I want to thank everyone for your relentless work over these 25 years to make this province more accessible. I work in the developmental services field myself uh, with people with autism and Down syndrome and other developmental disabilities, and so I share your passion, your zeal, and your drive to do more. I think there's a lot to be, that, that's done, been done in Ontario uh, to come all this way, and by 2025, technically, uh, all our buildings, all our documents, and our way of life should be accessible. But I don't know how true that is. Even today, architects, interior designers, landscape architects, and other designs, um, uh, other builders who design our spaces aren't being trained in accessibility. And that's on us as politicians. Um, our building code doesn't do enough. And even the AODA, which is a fantastic piece of legislation, doesn't do enough. Greens have presented our new ambitious housing plan and we've made sure that it includes the fact that housing needs to be accessible, accessible based not just on the AODA standards, but the gap that exists between the minimums defined and what Human Rights Code is asking for. There's an opportunity here. When we try to green our buildings, it is an, also an opportunity to make them accessible by making sure that the retrofits are not only energy efficient, but also make those dwellings accessible. We often don't think about the biases that we hold um, about people with disabilities and what they should and can do. Um, for example, if someone has um, um, a vision uh, disability, we think that maybe they shouldn't be venturing out. But we need to fight those every single day because the other choice is a form of discrimination. Our main goal should always be inclusion and empowerment of people within community. So here's hoping that all parties will be working towards this very important goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those very thoughtful comments as well. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, John Fraser, Mr. John Fraser of the Liberal Party. Thank you.
it's a real pleasure to be here with you today on the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And um, I like to think of it in two ways. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here and for your years of advocacy. And the two ways I think about it is it's a celebration. It's a celebration like a birthday. And so I, I mentioned the legislature, uh, someone who taught me a lot. Her name was Linda Smith. She lived in Ottawa. Uh, she knew every politician in Ottawa when the minister was about 55 years old. And she would try to develop mental disability, what I preferred to call an exceptionality. And her exceptionality was she had this incredible ability to bring people together. So she passed away about four years ago, very close to this time of year. And I was amazed at how many people from different walks of life and different political persuasions were all there. And Linda, Linda really had a hard time understanding why people were the way they were in the world sometimes, why they were dismissive or rude or not acknowledging someone's presence. And she, she'd be hurt, easily hurt, but she was incredibly resilient and uh, she'd be quick to forgive if you did something that offended her or hurt her. So I, I always tried to see the world through Linda's eyes when I thought about her, which I, I don't know if I've successfully done, I've seen some of it. I think that's our role as politicians, is to try to see the world through people's eyes, and not just people with developmental disabilities, but, but everyone. And uh, that's what you do when you come here, uh, to help us see it through your eyes. And I've seen that, you know, I, I, you know it's, it's, it's a, an interesting thing that, uh, it's not interesting, it's, you know, kind of awful, you know, we, we, we're still talking about uh, accessible washrooms, uh, and it's 2019. My father-in-law just passed away recently, had a wheelchair, and for about four years, and we take him out every Sunday. Um, we couldn't call and find out, as many of you know, we couldn't call, because they said, yes, we have it. You had to go and scope the place at first, right? And every once in a while you get to a place where you, like, for, you know, not even lifts, but you couldn't get around a corner. And... Um, that's just a, that's amazing to me uh, that there's not an ability to let to help people guide themselves through life where business owners aren't don't have a, a standard where people can rely on that. And so you know, he helped me see that uh, not quite through his eyes, but I understood his frustration. And so there's we we come some way. There's still a long, long way to go. And the last thing I want to say is the other thing as legislators is we need to be able to hear the voices that are hardest to hear. Right? People who don't have a big lobby group, a big lobby group here today, but you know, people who are living with a disability, an individual, the challenges that they have. And uh, you bring those voices here, you bring those voices to your communities. You've been doing that for 25 years. Keep doing it. We need you to do it. And we need to commit to do more to ensure that our communities are accessible and available and there for all of us. Thank you very much, Mercy. Thank you very much, Mr. Frazier. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge another colleague of Minister Minister Chose in the room. Uh, Minister Todd Smith, Minister of Children and Community Social Services, has joined us as well. Minister Smith, if you're in the room, please. Oh, Dave. Dave Smith. Dave and Todd. Dave and Todd. Okay. Dave and Todd. Okay. Dave and Todd. Okay. Sorry, I, I didn't uh, recognize another MPP. Uh, Dave Smith right here. Wave your hand. Thank you, Dave. It's, it really means a lot to have everybody come out and join in the celebration, our birthday cake today. Uh, so thank you everybody for being here. So finally, this is our final speaker of the day. It gives me great pleasure to introduce David Lukowski, the chair of the AODA Alliance, and the, as I said earlier, great, great, great granddaddy of the AODA to provide us with some closing remarks and uh, get us ready for some cake. So over to you, David.
I'm usually giving the feedback, not getting the feedback. <laughs> Thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you to the organizers for a fantastic job of pulling this event together. If you're live tweeting, use the hashtag uh, AODA and tag at AODA Alliance, which you should all be following. And if you're the one or two people in this, these two rooms that don't yet get our email updates, find Odelia. Odelia, wave your hand and give her your email address. That's right, our work never stops. 25 years ago, last Friday, on November 29th, 1994, about 20 of us ended up here, not to form a movement, to, but to watch a committee hearing. We left the committee hearing so frustrated that someone found us a room to meet in, in we walked, and that day was born the movement for the AODA. None of us knew what we were getting into. I sure didn't. <laughs> but what started that day was a tenacious, unstoppable, relentless movement and it's carrying forward now with the same tenacity as it has throughout those 25 years. At every step, we beat the odds. Many thought it would be impossible to get a divided, fractious disability community to unite around the goal of an accessibility law but we did. Many thought it was impossible to get disability service providing charitable organizations to team up with disability consumer organizations to work together on that goal, but we did. Many thought that disability service providing organizations wouldn't want to rock the boat at Queens Park by insisting on legislation that fully honored our rights. But they did. Many thought that when we were began this campaign, a media that did not know about us would pay no attention. But with our efforts, they did. Many, many thought that we could never get a single political party to make commitments to us on our agenda. But in every provincial election since 1995, at least one, two, or all three did. When we were offered weak legislation early in our campaign, many thought, some thought, if we turn it down, we won't get anything better. But we did turn it down, and we did get something much better. In 2001, when a weak accessibility law was passed in Ontario, some thought, we gave it our shot, no one will touch it again. But we carried on, and new legislation was introduced and passed in 2005. Many thought that it would be impossible to get three political parties that cannot agree on the time of day <laughs> to unite to support legislation over which they had been divided for a decade. But in May 2005, every single member of the legislature in the chamber that day rose first to vote for final passage of the AODA and then to applaud its passage. Some thought that, well, they passed the law, nothing will happen. But commendably, action started soon and was focused in the right direction. Some, many, think that because momentum has fallen off over the past nine or ten years, we won't be able to get back on schedule. But folks, we've done it before. We beat the odds every single time. And we will do it again. So what's the secret to our success? Well, listen up, politicians, and listen up, 
disability community organizations. And listen up individuals. Listen up everybody. We already know the secret to our success. The secret to our success is not, and I emphasize not, some loud mouth, balding, blind lawyer <laughs> who writes a hundred page document and calls it a brief. <laughs> the secret to our success is every single individual who has a disability or will later get a disability who takes this challenge on, who gets on a Twitter even if they don't know how to use it, who phones their member of the legislature even if they don't know who the heck they are, who writes a letter to the editor, who goes to community events like this, and who keeps the pressure on. It's been going on for 25 years, and it started with only 20 people and a budget of zero. So, let's look to the future. Some of the people who fought in this campaign, wonderful people, did not live to celebrate this 25th anniversary. There's so many I could name, but I'm only going to name a couple. People who I had the privilege of knowing, working with, and becoming friends with. The likes of Carol Rebeck, Barb Turnbull, Ingwong Ward, Don Ogner, and Michael Lewis. Some of them you may have heard of, some of them you may know, some of them you may never have heard of or known. But guess what? You've just heard their voices. Because as I listen to Danielle, and as I listened to Clara, I heard Don and Michael and Ing and Carol and Barb. I heard their arguments, I heard their dedication, I heard their impatience, and I heard their determination. The next generation whom we celebrate today and to whom we will be passing a torch shortly, not because any of us are stepping down, but because they're going to step up. They are the key to our success. So our message to them is twofold. Number one, grab one of those torches. Somebody hold them up there. Unbelievably tacky. <laughs> <laughs> and the deal is this. Every young person, and young means you're at least Wendy's age or younger. <laughs> Thank you. Because she's only a great, great, great grandmother in the world. <laughs> any older than the day I met her 25 years ago. Every single one of you, I want you to take that torch, walk up to one of those members of parliament, pose for a selfie, and demand what they're going to do to help our cause. I can tell you, I conclude by a message to the next generation a message that came to all of us over the past 25 years that I got in a fortune cookie. <laughs> the day in May 2005 when the AODA was going to have its final third reading vote, we knew it would pass, we knew it would pass unanimously. Before coming here for that ceremonial and powerful moment, I went out to lunch with a buddy who had no involvement in our cause, a colleague from work. We went to a Chinese restaurant, and at the end of the meal, they gave me a fortune cookie. Now, sadly, the fortune was not in Braille, because it would have had to be a fortune cake. Which I wouldn't have minded. But I passed the fortune to my buddy, and he read it to me. That fortune's message spoke to all of us who campaigned for that law from 94 to 05, to all of us who campaigned for the past 15 years in a battle to get it effectively implemented, and to all of you who will take the torch up today. And I can conclude with the words of that, of that visionary fortune cookie. It said, every great accomplishment is at first impossible. Thank you all very much. Thank you, David. And here we are at the end of our speeches. But you've heard quite a bit today about, uh, about the history of the AODA, where we started 
25 years ago, this vision for an accessible and inclusive future. And we've heard from, from many folks up here, uh, particularly young people from within the disability grass, grassroots movement, where do we need to go next? Uh, and there is a passing of a torch here, definitely. And there's also birthday cake. So, uh, as I said earlier, what is a party without cake? We have cake. And I, and I know for a fact, David, you want to sing happy birthday to the AODA. <laughs> shall, shall we do it, everybody? Okay, here we go. I'm going to start, but you have to join in. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much, everybody.